We're here to discuss two of the top wings that are going to go in the lottery in this upcoming NBA draft. It is AJ Griffin and Jeremy Sohan coming up next. You are locked on the NBA draft. This is the Big Board NBA Draft Podcast. As you can tell, I am subbing in today for Raphael. He is out and about doing all his interviews. I know recently he's interviewed Jake LaRavia, one of my favorite prospects in this coming class. He is out on the road doing that, having fun, getting work done. So I am here today with Leaf Tulin to cover uh, for Raphael. So I am Sam Ferris. I am going to host today. And so before we get into anything, the first thing I want to say is thank you so much for listening to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you for making it hopefully your first listen today. And again, hopefully that is the case every day. Um, you can follow me at Draft Dummies on Twitter, especially over the next two months as we ramp up for the draft. I'll be posting my thoughts, stats, and clips. And Leaf, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, first, tell the listeners where they can follow you and uh, excited to get into this topic today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. And uh, my, my Twitter is just my name, L-E-I-F-T-H-U-L-I-N. And I'm, I post my draft thoughts and a lot of basketball, both collegiate and NBA on there. And then I host a podcast called the College Sports Hive. Awesome. So let's get into AJ Griffin without any further ado. I think he's the guy we'll jump into here first. And I've got a lot of thoughts on him, but we'll start. Uh, obviously, he is a wing. We're going to talk about two of the wings today. And in the final segment, what I like to always do is kind of talk about some of our thoughts and theories as it pertains to wings. This, you know, positional group in the NBA draft. And then, of course, we've got to rank them against each other and talk about where, in general, we'll kind of end up with these guys on our big boards. But let's get into kind of some of the details, some thoughts. We're not going to go through the whole scouting report on AJ Griffin, but some kind of fun thoughts on him. But the first place we got to start off with in regards to AJ Griffin is his biggest strength, which is the jump shot. I'll start with the stats on that over 46 percent or excuse me 45 percent from three 79 percent from the free throw line and i always like to also look at just on synergy the no dribble spot ups which is again just a good indicator of how good of a shooter they are he shot over 46 percent which is a ridiculous clip for a teenager um so that's obviously the number one skill. What stands out to you there as it uh, pertains to AJ Griffin? Yeah, he's a ready shooter. His people pick a bone with his stance, which I think is it's uh, it's repeatable. He he's got a wide stance, and he but his shot is very fluid. It doesn't influence like the speed. Um, there's a tiny bit of a low release, but like I said, he's big. He's got long arms, and his shot is be is beautiful. I think he's one of the best five shooters in the class with without much discussion there. Uh, I think the other thing about him is he, he battled injuries from his senior year in high school into the beginning of his career at Duke. And I think that limited his explosiveness, but I think there's potential because before his senior year of high school, he was a, I mean, obviously in high school, you're going to look like a better, better athlete than you are in college. Everyone does. Um, there's no exceptions to that, but he, he looked like a phenomenal athlete that had a shot and that, and then in college, he looked like a supplementary shooter who, who excelled shooting the ball, but wasn't an explosive athlete. And my hope is that as he matures and his, his health gets better, and that's always the hope with anyone, um, that he can be an, a somewhat explosive athlete with a beautiful shot. Yeah, I totally agree. It's funny because I had him, I was higher than basically everyone on him coming in. I had him top three on my board coming into the season because of the frame where you said it, the six foot six with like a six eleven wingspan. And, you know, oftentimes when we talk about prospects, there's so much projection we have to do in terms of them filling into their bodies physically. Well, 
one of his underrated strengths is actually his literal physical strength where he's well built his frame especially his base is strong and that probably helps with his shot too as well and so the jump shot the strength you talked about that that all leads into the through line with aj griffin is where is he at in terms of his recovery from the injuries he had the dislocated kneecap in college and then when he was ramping up to start the college season had another sprained knee so that kind of slowed him up in terms of getting ready for his loan season at duke and so i so i believe if you have him top seven eight whatever range you want to say if you're high on him to me you have to believe that he has not yet returned to his peak athleticism you have to believe that with the strength and conditioning coach and team in the nba that he's going to step up another leap or two from where he's at right now yeah i'm fully with you and i think the other thing that's on his side is his youth i mean obviously he's a one and done but he's he's also a a guy who is a traditional age for his class of high school graduation and class of uh, freshman year of college and then from a basketball standpoint you mentioned his his physical stature and it's it's very impressive for an 18 year old and 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 one thing that you you would hope improves is that with that body he can go to the rim and that comes with athleticism but he showed he had a intermediate game where he was able to have a good enough touch to shoot floaters even when he wasn't bouncing off of the um off the ground like a like a monster like he's not jumping over people and dunking very often but he's able to get to his spot he's a capable slasher um, and I was impressed with his uh, intermediate game and not necessarily floaters, but he shoots pull up jump shots, a little a few runners. And, and I think that is something that is going to be overlooked that he was able to do that without full capacity. And like you said, if you're banking on him to be a top seven, eight pick, you, you are banking on him to uh, improve as an athlete and, and recover from those injuries. Um, from what he showed at Duke. And I think that's a subtle thing that's that differentiates him in terms of potential because most people seem to see him as a cut and dry product. Yeah, kind of like you alluded to, his role at Duke was to space the floor and he did it phenomenally well. He didn't get to the rim that often. And also to go along with that, a low turnover rate just because not a lot of risky drives. He wasn't creating any advantages at least on a consistent basis and to go along with that as well also a low free throw rate but there are a lot of reasons for that that i don't read too far into number one is because he's so fresh coming off recovering from these injuries two because of the college spacing and then number three just because of the way duke's team was set up this year especially paulo being the primary guy he liked to initiate from that mid-range area which didn't allow a lot of drives from perimeter guys. And so that was his role. He didn't do that. But the question with him, as we've said, and as we've repeated is, how much is that athleticism from his pre-injury stage going to come back? Or is that kind of sapped long-term? Can he get to the rim with more space in the NBA is kind of the question with him. But actually, I think that as much defensively as offensively, like I would even argue that potentially how much his athleticism and his quick twitch ability, his burst, how much that returns or how much he can improve from where he's at right now will actually probably impact the defense even more so than the offense. Um, do you agree with me that, uh, Leaf? And also just on draft Twitter, there's like a huge discussion right now is AJ Griffin a terrible defender? Is he fine? Where does he kind of fall in general on that scale for you? I do agree with you about that defense is going to be the most impacted thing by his quick, uh, quick twitch athleticism. I think that the people saying he's terrible are overreacting. Yeah. Um, I think there was one game in particular he was attacked, and that was the Virginia Tech game uh, where they were the Duke switches a lot of screens and thus. Virginia Tech would pick him as the defender they wanted to attack. And yes, that means something. But that said, Duke has a unique like foray of athletes. They just they have their choice. Um, and and if he's the worst of those five, it means less than if he's the worst of other teams. That said, NBA has those type of athletes, and that is a concern. Um, but you can't teach six six 
uh, 6'11 wingspan, 225 at 18 years old, and adequate foot speed, especially coming off of a knee injury. And, and I think I think that's that's the word I describe him as defensively. I wouldn't say he's bad, and I wouldn't say he's good. I think he's adequate. I think he doesn't he doesn't really get um, punished for being bad. I don't think you put him on the best player. And I know the labels three and D, and like you're, you're all searching for a Mikel Bridges. Um, I think I think he's not quite in that mold. And you know maybe a guy like Ochag Baji is getting a lot of traction on draft Twitter. But that guy's 20, 21, 22 years old. AJ Griffin's 18 and is probably a better shooter. And Ochag Baji has his fair share of people who are skeptical of his defense. And even though he's a tremendous vertical athlete. Uh, so, I, 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 yeah, that's my takeaway. I think he's, he's just fine. And he projects to be an adequate defensive player in the NBA. Yep, I agree with you there. My final thought on him on the defensive side of the ball is that I think – that the number one, or I won't say number one, one of the biggest mistakes that evaluators can make is um, digging too far into the minutia, into the details defensively, especially as it pertains to a teenager. And we've seen so many examples of this, whether it's a Clay Thompson or a Ben Simmons, guys that they get to college for one season or two, don't understand the role, they're still young, but guess what? Teenagers are never good at defense. And so for me, I don't want to overreact too much to the minutia, the details. The number one thing you look at is the physical tools, which you said. The length is the number one thing you look at. It's the biggest indicator of how well defense translates to the NBA. He's got plus size and plus wingspan, plus length for his position. And then the other thing you want to see is at least some level of understanding and feel on the defensive end, because if a guy just doesn't understand it all, then it's going to be tough. But to me, he's shown at least he's to the threshold where I believe that he's going to be able to learn schemes. He's going to understand rotations. I think overall, he's a solid to, to good feel player. And so he meets those thresholds. Yes, the quickness. The ability to slide, you know, quickly side to side. Those are things he's going to need to work on with a strengthening and conditioning coach. But if those things come along, then he's got the tools. He meets the check marks for me. And I just don't want to overreact too much to the details, especially as it pertains to an 18-year-old kid. I'm with you there. And, and one question I have for you real quickly if, if, um, is, is when you watch AJ Griffin, what do you think? And this is something that happens with Duke and Kentucky in, in particular, where they have such a like just a wide array of talent. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a beneficial thing that he's playing a role and he's used to playing a role, uh, or do you think if he went to a different program, he, he, you know, his his feathers could have been extended further, his wings could have expanded uh, expanded further, and he could have had a bigger role and and it's been a primary option. Do you think that is better or the fact that Duke made him play a role that he'll likely play in the NBA and, you know, there's more spacing, there's things that are different, but uh, what do you think of that? Yeah, it's, it's a tough discussion. I think it depends on the individual. It's funny because I had this discussion. I kind of disagreed with Raphael. We were talking about Pat Baldwin and he was saying, well, he should have dominated the bad competition and that's fair. Like he did not put up numbers that uh, were good enough. He didn't live up to the expectations. Like that's fair. He did not have a good season, but he also played on an awful team with an awful context, like one of the worst teams, to be honest, in college basketball. And so if he were put in AJ Griffin situation, I believe he would have looked better than he did. And if AJ Griffin were put on that Milwaukee team, like, I don't think he would have looked very good, to be honest, especially um, with A.J. Griffin kind of recently coming back from injuries, doesn't have the full quickness, ability to get to the rim off the dribble and create as much for himself. I think he was in a decent situation. Now, I think he he's a good enough player that he would have looked better in most situations, especially because of his shooting ability, he provides that space for everyone else. So that's going to look good and fit well in most situations, but it is an interesting discussion. Like should 
Pat Baldwin have looked better playing with terrible competition against terrible competition? Because it goes both ways. If you have terrible teammates, but you're playing terrible competition, it's also difficult. Um, I think it's just a case-by-case basis. And I think that overall, I think he was in a fair situation where there were others where he could have looked good. But I think he was in a situation where he was just able to show off his biggest skill, which was shooting. And I think it's worked from fine because I think he's going to go top 10 in the draft. Yeah, I'm with you there. All right, well, we've got to get into a break. I always tend to go long because I love to discuss these prospects. But to me, I think the next guy we have coming up in Jeremy Sohan is even more probably intriguing to me. So we're going to talk about him after this quick break. All right, NBA fans, are you looking for a daily fantasy option for the NBA that you need to try the award-winning app Prize Picks? It's daily fantasy made easy. I love this, and we believe you will too. The best thing about it, it's easy to use. You just pick two to five players and an over-under on their projections, and you can win up to 10 times on any entry. Plus, Prize Picks is safe, and they offer quick withdrawals. So use the award-winning app on both the App Store and Google Play. So for a limited time, PrizePix has an exclusive no-brainer offer for all our users. Get $50 for free if a player in your first PrizePix entry scores a single point, but you miss, must use code NBA. That's right. This is uh, an exclusive offer available to Locked On fans. Sign up today. Use promo code NBA for $50 for free if a player in your first prize picks entry scores a single point. All right, so the next prospect we're going to talk about is another wing. It is Jeremy Sohan out of Baylor. To me, Leaf, he's one of the most intriguing prospects in this class. As I've had time to dive further into him, he's a guy that I've moved up my board. And... The, the point that I want to start with, and you can kind of take this wherever you want, but obviously as evaluators, we want to be continually learning. And so when I look back at the last draft class, to me, I think, what's the number one thing I learned? And I think one of the biggest lessons I took away was when a prospect has plus plus length for his position and has plus feel with some level of perimeter skill set, then those guys don't fail. Those guys are very valuable. And we had multiple guys in that class, the Franz Wagner, we had Scotty Barnes, and I'd even throw Evan Mobley into that discussion. And I think Jeremy Sohan, it fits somewhere in that discussion. We can have the debate where, you know, he would rank amongst that group. I certainly wouldn't have him above a guy like Evan Mobley, but... One thing you can't deny is that he is very long at like six foot nine. I don't know his exact wingspan, but it's very long. He's a guy that can play the four and defend multiple positions. And I think he's a very, I I won't say extremely, he's not the same level of ball handler or passer as a guy like Scotty Barnes, but he's a high field player, very young. And I think he has a chance to be a potential all in all defensive guy at the NBA level. And so you just can't teach that level of length combined with that feel. And he's got the baseline skill on the perimeter where if you squint hard enough, you can see that really developing. Yeah, he's one of the more uh, polarizing prospects because the traits that he has mm-hmm. are are those that are super modern. Like, I think yeah. that if this draft were even five years ago where the NBA started becoming three and D heavy, I think he'd be a lot lower seen as lower, but because of what is winning uh, is the defense, the versatility of the guys who can switch, he becomes far more. um, He just, he becomes a guy that is seen as, as a a luxury rather than a player that is uh, complimentary, I think. Mm -hmm. And so a couple of things I thought I, I recognized about him is, He's got plus facilitating, which I I think is it really awesome. He's got great feel offensively, but as an NBA prospect, uh, poke holes in this theory, if you, if you'd like, but um, Mm -hmm. I, I think that he, his facilitation 
that he really kind of built a name for himself around offensively. That's what like his greatest skill was against Kansas in particular that he played the 0.5 basically. And he created offense. That's when draft Twitter went nuts. They're like, Oh my gosh, this guy's guarding one through five and he's playing their point guard yeah. as their five defensively. Uh, I'm not sure he does that in the NBA uh, unless you put him in like a Boris DL role where he's passing out of the post. But I also think he's perimeter perimeter oriented, but his shot isn't quite there. Um, so I, I like him defensively a lot and I, I'm on board with what you said there. Offensively, I have a few questions. I wanted to gauge your, your thoughts on that. No, those are totally fair questions. And I'm not saying you're wrong at all. Like uh, it's all up for opinion. The thing from my point of view, I think I was kind of where you are on Sohan. I was in that same boat with Scotty Barnes and Franz Wagner last year where I was like, Scotty Barnes isn't quick enough. He's not that athletic. Like, sure, he's very long, but is his passing really going to be that useful? And I think Barnes is a little bit pa better passer than Sohan. But I, even if he's not the primary guy, just to add another high field guy that can pass at a position, like at the four, where generally most teams don't really have a lot of passing, that's still added value in my opinion. And so... I'm not saying you're wrong again. I think last year, I personally kind of missed what's the saying, the forest for the trees with, with those two guys because I thought, you know, they're both a little passive. Like, they're not great athletes, even though they're long. They're not primary guys. Like, how valuable is that really going to be offensively? And then, like, both Barnes and Wagner completely exceeded my expectations offensively. And I... I kind of see a lot of similarities with Scotty Barnes, to be honest, where they're both crazy long. Like neither of them are like the most natural, like fluid scorers. And they're not like pogo stick athletes either, but they just have the feel and they figure things out. And they, they're just additive players where they just add feel, they add skill, they add defense. They're things that they add to your team regardless of how much they have the ball in their hands. And so like, I feel like I was kind of missing the forest for the trees when you look at that length combined with the feel. And so I, I, I'm kind of um, correcting back in the opposite direction. And that's why I think I'm a little higher on Sohan this year. Yeah, that's, that's interesting and a, and a fair point. I was high on Barnes and fairly low on Wagner. And I, I see Sohan as more of a, a little worse shooting Wagner than I do of a Barnes. Okay. I'm not that I disagree with your points in that, in that he uh, does add things. He's a very good defender. He can facilitate. I just think Barnes was more like it, ball in his hands all the time. Yeah. I can see that being an NBA straight. Whereas Sohan, I think is very much like situational. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I have on Sohan that I, I want to get your thoughts on is I think he's got quick feet defensively, but I don't think he's a, as and you, you mentioned it as well. Scotty Barnes isn't a vertical athlete, yeah. but he doesn't block shots very much. He's just, he relies on his feet, which I think is actually great as a four, but in the small ball era, I don't know if he plays the five in the NBA. Um, and, and I sound like I'm really negative on Sohan, but I've actually got him in my lottery. So, or at 14 or 15. So uh, I, I think, I think the swing skill for him is three point shooting. He shot 29%. Yep. And I think, the team that picks him, I think he's more situational than a guy like Barnes would have been. I think Barnes, obviously, was number four pick and he won rookie yeah. of the year. But uh, I think he's a slight bit more situational than even a guy like A.J. Griffin is because if you can shoot, you can shoot. Whereas Sohan's skill set needs to be influenced by a team like the Raptors, for instance, that, that employ long defenders and allow you to play kind of additive basketball, as you put it, which I, which I really like. Yeah. No, those are good points. A cu couple different questions there. So I, I agree. I don't think he's the level of ball handler or facilitator that Barnes was offensively. And then, yeah. So the reason I kind of compared Barnes and Sohan was more so physically because I feel like the way they move and just their length is similar, but also that I was kind of worried about Barnes because he's not a vertical athlete and Sohan... I think he's maybe slightly better than Barnes, but not significantly more so. I do think he's a little bit more of a rim protector than Barnes, or he can be. But part of that is also the situation, because at Florida State, Barnes played like exclusively 
guarding the perimeter almost exclusively. And so, yeah, there are certainly differences. And I, like, if you were to ask me who would I rather have right now, Barnes or Sohan, based on what we saw as a rookie, I'd take Barnes. Um, but I still think he has a lot of those traits, and he is so long defensively. Like, I think oftentimes we overrate switching onto guards because so few guys can really do it that effectively. But I do think he's a guy that he'll he'll he's basically a modern four, right? But I could see him playing the five if if he needs to, and I think he'll do a serviceable job switching onto guards. I don't know if I'm. It sounds like I might be higher on, on him defensively. I just think length is the number one thing you look at combined with feel. And he was he is so long, and I think he's going to increase his athleticism a little bit as he gets to the NBA, kind of like we talked about with A.J. Griffin. Uh, one other stat for you, just kind of a fun one here. He was the only freshman this year to post at least a 2.5% steal rate 2.5% block rate in a 3.5 defensive box plus minus. Does that really mean much? I don't know. It's just kind of a query I came up with that showed that, you know, he was effective defensively and also had the ability to get steals and blocks, which kind of shows um, the activity and just the length and steal ability defensively. Um, any other thoughts from you on, on Sohan before we move into the final segment? I just had a potential comparison. Uh, uh -huh. This is these are two kind of opposite players that I think fit something Sohan does. What do you think of a Boris Diaw on offense mm -hmm. and a Aaron Gordon on defense mix? Yeah, I mean that would be a that would be a good player. I mean Boris Diaw in his prime, I think it was a little later on Boris Diaw. Yeah, I'm, little... I'm not saying like most improved of 2006 Boris Diaw. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that would still be a valuable player if the passing, again, it's just so hard because like with a lot of prospects, what level of shooter does he become? Um, one quick stat on that. If you're looking at the positive with him, 40% from him on long twos, and he shot 36% on spot ups, which is pretty decent. He did take like a few or like a decent amount of pull ups, which wasn't as great, but at least he showed that he can do it. So that lowered the percentages. Now, I'm not saying that he's like a great shooter right now. That's that's certainly up for debate, and we're going to see what happens. That is the swing skill with him. Um, but I think that's a fun comparison. I've liked Aaron Gordon defensively more than most have. Um, but we'll finish this discussion, including ranking them, including any final thoughts on wings in general in this final segment coming up next. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews and news, including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of the MLB season. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering info from live betting to playoffs, esports and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline, where the game starts. Again, thank you for making this show your first listen every day. Make sure to continue to check out the Locked On NBA Big Board. That's the show we're hosting today in place of Rafael Barlow. But Richard Stamen's on there. Myself, Sam Ferris, Leaf, who's joining me today, especially with the draft coming up. Over the next two months, we're going to be doing a lot of work ramping up for that. So go ahead and give that a listen. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. All right, in this final segment, just wanted to finish up our thoughts on wings and talk about where in general Leaf and I might end up with these guys on our boards. So Leaf, this morning as I was kind of thinking, preparing, gathering some thoughts about what I wanted to talk about today, one point to me as it uh, pertains to wings, uh, we know there's a dearth of wings there's always a need for wings in the NBA. So the way that I kind of thought about this is the NBA and the draft is a zero sum game. What I mean by that is there are only so many minutes to go around. And so wings tend to have more opportunity because now this is way oversimplifying, but if you think about the general construction of an NBA team, 
generally there's one guy that's like a creator one big and like three wings or versatile defenders now that's way oversimplifying it but what i'm saying is if you're a wing and you can be a versatile defender there's just way more opportunity for you to get minutes you can basically play like three of those guys at the same time whereas if you're a six foot guard or you're a center that's not defensively versatile you can only play one of those guys at a time and generally nba teams will only have a few of those guys total on the roster so when I talk about opportunity, I mean two things. Number one, you only have so many opportunities to prove yourself. So when you get those more minutes at the start, because you can play multiple wings at the same time, those guys generally just tend to have more of a chance to prove themselves. But also when you make it and establish yourself as an NBA player, then you also have the opportunity to provide, uh, in my opinion, more value for your team because there are just so few good defensively versatile wings that are also effective offensively so again to summarize it's a zero-sum game there's only so many many minutes to go around if you are actually a wing that can defend versatility and provide something on offense every team needs you and there's just more opportunity to make it and prove yourself and then provide value once you make it um so what's your thought on that? What's your take on that? How do you value wings when it comes to the draft? I think they're the most valuable unless you're in the top five. Mm-hmm. I think in the top five, you take the dominant players who can be wings, but often are bigs or guards or uh, ball dominant guards, I should say. Yep. I think from there, you supplement what your team's built around, which is typically a ball dominant big or a or in some cases, um, a defensive anchor type of big and a ball dominant wing or guard. And then you supplement around them with versatile defense. And, and that's where the wings come in. And I'm a jazz fan and, and you see the lack of that with that team. And I think it's really heightened my attention to it. And I think, I think it would be silly to say that the NBA as a whole hasn't heightened their attention to it because you've seen the recipes that have won the past few years and it's a copycat league. And I think, teams are trying to replicate the formulas that have one Um, like for instance i think one of the more i mean it's sad to say but one of the more uh replicable formulas that people are trying to emulate is what the clippers did they got a lot of strong wings and exposed the jazz in in a way like that and how valuable is a guy like terrence mann where can you pick a guy like terrence mann terrence mann went undrafted for instance um can you pick a guy like terrence mann at 30 And so now if you're in the first round, you got a guy like Sohan who could be a a top 10 pick. He becomes even more valuable. The, the value of length and athleticism and switchability versatility, both on offense and defense becomes heightened. And I, and I really do believe that wings are kind of the the future. That's the prototype of the future. Yep. And one other good example I'd add to that is what the Pelicans have done. And I think it's interesting because Herb Jones, second round pick, Alvarado is obviously not a wing, but because of his defense, he's like kind of has that similar value where he's so effective defensively, even especially guarding the smaller guards, but can guard multiple positions. But I think it's interesting how they have focused on with their second round picks and undrafted guys. They pick guys with skills that they know are going to translate, especially they focused on the defense and they think if this this guy is definitely good enough to play in the NBA defensively. If we can get something else out of him, then he is going to be an NBA player. And that's, that's even hard to find in the second round. And so I think that's an interesting way they've gone about it. And they've taken the wings. Uh, Herb Jones is everyone's favorite player right now. Um, TM3 as well. But I mean, there's just a bunch of them. But at the same time, there isn't enough to go around and every NBA team is still looking for those guys. So to finish up here, Leaf, I'll have you go first. Tell me where in general you think you'll have both AJ Griffin and Jeremy Sohan. Um, I know my board is not final yet, but where do you kind of have them on your board right now? I've got AJ at seven or eight right now. Um, I could see anywhere from six through nine. And for Sohan, I think I've got uh, around 12 uh, 
I'll go 10 through 14. I, 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 I can kind of slot those guys at the end of the lottery any which way. And it kind of depends who's there. Obviously that's not how a big board works, but that's just yeah. the way my brain works. I think of fits sometimes. Yeah. Um, so I'd, yeah, I'd go, I'd go a little higher for AJ than I am for Suhan, but both players that I expect to be picked in the lottery. Yeah. So I've got, um, I've got them both in kind of the same tier. So I have them both in kind of the seven to like 11 range. I have a couple different wings in there. We didn't talk about Matherin today. Another guy that I have in that range, uh, Shaden Sharp, I have just above these guys, uh, due to his upside, but I really, so hands a guy I've moved up. I've always been high on AJ Griffin. I had him top three coming in. I certainly believe in the, the shooting. Like you said, that translates. That's, that's a stone cold skill that he has that every team needs. And so it's hard to move him too far down from there. Um, both of these guys are fascinating. I'm excited to see where they end up, but uh, Leaf, thank you for taking the time today to join me. Uh, anything you want to plug, or if not, maybe just shout out your social media one more time before we finish up. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, Leaf Too Lean is my Twitter, L E I F T H U L I N, and I'm happy to I'll be on here again soon. All right, you can follow me at Draft Dummies, and thank you, listeners, for tuning in. We very much appreciate it. 